Welcome back, and I'm your host, Tara Bullman. So I'm super excited to talk about today's topic because it is an area that I see so many women entrepreneurs struggling in. And once you understand your messaging and your brand positioning, it's a major game changer. So let me tell you about my guest today. She's beyond awesome. We met at a conference in California not too long ago. And I was like, please be on my podcast. My ladies need to know what you have to offer. So um, let me read her bio and then I'll introduce her. So as a copywriter and designer, Lisa helps service-based entrepreneurs look, sound, and sell like the high value experts that they are so they can attract better clients, make more money, and have a bigger impact with their work. She helps clients define strong brand positioning or what she likes to call their brand's star power. She also writes the words they need for their, all their marketing materials, also known as their brand messaging. From that, she develops beautiful high converting websites. As a result, her clients become incredibly clear and confident in their communications, making it easy to connect with ideal prospects so that they have highly effective sales conversations. So please welcome me and joining Lisa Hoffman. Hi, Lisa, how are you doing today? Hello, I thank you so much for having me here, Tara. I'm, it's a real honor and a pleasure. I'm, I'm so honored. And I remember very specifically, we were having lunch and you told me what you did, which was I'm a copywriter and I'm a designer. And I was like, mm -hmm. you're rare, you're rare. <laughs> Cause most people are just, either copywriters or they focus on the design side. And for you, it's like you do both, which is really, really cool. So I can't wait to dig in. So tell us, where are you calling in from today? Yeah, I'm actually right now located in Guyana, South America. Wow. So I am normally in Washington state in the US, um, but we have moved down here when my husband took a job for the government. And so we moved the family down here about a year and a half ago and have been having quite an adventure since. I bet. I bet. What has been the biggest challenge before we hop into brand positioning, all that stuff? I'm, yeah. I have a couple clients that are with, they, they call themselves digital nomads. So they yeah. live you know, all over the world and just mm -hmm. do their business from there. So I always like to say, what's been the biggest, like, you know, I guess the biggest challenge in moving down to uh, South America and then also the biggest joy. Yeah, well, I'll just kind of, since we're talking business, I'll just sort of keep yeah. it focused on that biggest business challenge has really been, um, honestly, it's been some of the tech, yeah. uh, you know, just making sure I've got good internet connectivity because even before we moved down here, I'd been working mostly online with most all of my clients. So you know, moving from maybe working locally in person with someone to doing more work online was that wasn't really much of a transition there. But just making sure we've got good internet access and honestly, the noise. Ah. <laughs> because living in the tropics, none of the houses have any insulation because you don't need that. And everything's concrete and we live in the city. And so you can imagine that the noise levels are just kind of, and I do a lot of recording and of course I'm meeting online with you know people almost all day long and just having that noise in the background that's probably been the biggest challenge yeah yeah but, I, um, can, I can see yeah, that sorry. for sure no <laughs> um yeah whenever I it was funny whenever I go to like Mexico or I try to work from wherever I'm at it's sometimes it's like the birds <laughs> Yeah, you know, and the and the nature, and it's just like you know, it's an amazing, beautiful sound. But you're like, okay, I gotta like edit that, you know, training video I just created. <laughs> so I, I totally get it. I totally get it. What's been the biggest joy or the? Aha? Oh my gosh, yeah. The yeah, the people here are really amazing. It's um, this is a culture of six different ethnicities that have wow. come together, and so living in an environment like that is just really enriching. It, you know, language wasn't an issue because Guyana is the only English speaking language or English speaking country in South America. I mean, English is the primary language. Um, so that wasn't an issue at all, which makes it, you know, all that much easier to interact with people. And really the, the people here are fabulous. And it is really lovely to live in a place where by and large, everyone gets along oh, and yeah. You, you know, because of all the different ethnic cultures coming together, there's lots of different holidays and different, 
you know, cuisine and all of that, that that's sort of a, this big melting pot and everybody sort of celebrates everyone else. So um, I love yeah, that. That's Probably story. a lot of really cool festivals and all that kind of fun stuff. Too. Yeah, Jeez. absolutely. That's so great. Well, thank you so much for sharing. So, yeah. so yeah, so that just goes to show you've been in business for about how long? I think full time since 2005, I thought I read. Yeah, exactly. So about 16 years. So full 16 time for years full yeah. time. And mm-hmm. you can create a business where you can literally live wherever you want in the world. That yeah. is, that's so much, that's so much inspiration for so many women entrepreneurs out there that are, you know, think that they feel stuck, that they're living in, you know, wherever and they have this travel bug like a lot of us have mm-hmm. to just be able to go see the world and not have to and you can you can live and enjoy you know where you're going and actually get your work done too so I, I love yeah. that so thank you for being an inspiration for sure on that oh, yeah all right well let's get into brand positioning so all right. knowing that you're a copywriter and a designer you know, what is the, what's the one thing that you see happening? And and primarily I work with women entrepreneurs. So whenever I speak Mm -hmm. of of them, it's always for, you know, the women entrepreneurs out there. What's the one thing that you, you see happening that really causes a lot of angst and struggle with women entrepreneurs around brand positioning? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, it starts with that question. What do you do? When, of course, when you, (laughs) when someone asks you that question or you're asking someone that question, this is how I, um, my experience with it is a lot of people freeze up and they're like, uh, uh, you know, or they're like, oh gosh, I hate that question. Is yeah. how do I explain it? Especially when you may do several different things really well. I mean, I think in this day and age, it's very common, especially as entrepreneurs to you know, be like the slashies or the multi hyphenate or the people who do very well and um, in several different areas. And so they're like, how do I even bring all of this together in a single statement? And that can be really difficult. And so it creates this angst around like responding to that very seemingly simple question, you know, like, what do you do? Yeah. So I think that's one of the the issues that I see with people is wanting to and not sure how to bring together like a couple different areas of focus that they Perfect. might have. I and I also, yeah, I work with a lot of people who are in transition as well. So, you know, they maybe they're transitioning out of corporate on, into entrepreneurship or they're making a pivot in their business. And so there is that element too that of like, well, now I'm doing something new or something different and I don't really know how to bring in my past experience and my past expertise into the thing I'm doing now. And so therefore, again, it's hard for me to respond to that question. What do you do? Yeah. Do you have like, I have like a thing that I do that I'll share with the audience. Oh, whenever, yeah. um, and then if you have any hacks or things that they can do to kind of you know, breathe through that and just answer it the best that they can. Right. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can, you know, we'll do some mock, you know, examples or something for, for people who are listening. But, um, you know, for me, I, when I go into a room, the, usually the first thing I do is I will like, I ask everyone about them first. Right. Mm-hmm. And I try not to ask the, so what do you do? Because I know the anxiety that I get. And sometimes I still get that way you know, sometimes you just got to feel like you're on versus just, Mm -hmm. I'm an introvert and an extrovert. So it just kind of depends on what I am that day, which, you know, adds to the complexity of everything. But I just, I go in and I just get people talking about themselves and then, but more on a personal level first. And then Mm -hmm. it's like, oh, by the way, so I'm sorry, I forgot to ask you, what do you do? You know, and then it feels a little bit like they don't have to turn into the robotic, you know, I am a blah, 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 you know, and I want it to feel more casual. And so as somebody who has struggled with that too, I try to like not be that person. Hi, what do you do? You know, anyway, so that's my little trick that I do. Um, What would you recommend, you know, for someone who they get that too, where it's like someone comes up to them, whether it's at a conference, it's like, what do you do? You know, what, what do you tell your clients? Yeah. Well, first of all, I love your technique. I think that's a very effective strategy is just um, start with something else when you're first meeting someone. But of course, you know, 
inevitably you end up in a situation where either you have to like introduce yourself in a room or, you know, maybe even online, right? Maybe you're in a Facebook group and you've got to like introduce yourself. And so you do have to kind of answer that question. What do you do? And I think one thing to keep in mind is similarly with your logo, it's not going to tell the whole story. You don't need to tell the whole story about what you do and, and how you do it and, and all of that. But if you can kind of keep it focused on just who you work with and maybe one of the main outcomes that they get. And just, again, recognize you do not need to try to squeeze it all into 10, 20 second response and follow that whatever your response is, you can follow it up with Tara was suggesting. I mean, just maybe lead right into and what do you do or something like that, you know, if you're in, in a in a one-to-one -one conversation. And the other thing that I recommend for people to do is to think about that question as though they're asking, what do you give? Mm. So if mm. you can think about it in, in that way, it's, it's a little bit of a semantic shift there, yeah. but it really can kind of help you think about, okay, what do I give through the work that I'm doing? Because this is going to kind of help you think about, again, more about the outcomes or the problem that you're solving. And that can help you push past a little bit of that challenge around trying to, or that um, need to try to squeeze it all in. Into I that love one. that. That that was such a golden nugget of, and just kind of flip the script. You know, what yeah. do you give, right? It's like, yeah. that's a great, because I just was like thinking about that myself. It's like the give feels more like the outcome, you know? Mm -hmm. So who do you give and what do you give? Like, yeah, who, what do you give and who do you give it to? That's gold <laughs> right there. So <laughs> you're only just in it and you're like giving <laughs> the great nuggets. So I love that. And then as far as like, you know, I guess maybe an, a good example, like how would you introduce yourself? If I was like, hi, Lisa, I'm Tara. What do you do? Like how, you know, what, what's your standard go-to? Well, I usually say, you know, oh, I work with people who are wanting to be seen and heard and sell like the high value experts that they are. Um, I, I mean, I really do kind of respond with that response, yeah. but oh my gosh, I, I've worked through a bajillion yeah. different versions of that. Yeah. And again, it, it really depends on mm -hmm. the situation. Yeah. It really does. Because again, as I was saying before, you don't need to have something that's going to be your go-to for every single situation that's going to say it all. Yeah. Uh, so I do sort of tailor it to the moment mm -hmm. that I'm in, depending on, you know, right, the environment and the person that I'm talking with. But it usually has something around that yeah. And that's exactly why I usually ask about them first, because mm -hmm. if I can learn what they do, I'm instantly like, oh, would this exactly. person be a good potential client of mine? Would it be a good potential referral partner? Would this be someone amazing for my podcast? Like, you know, I'm, I'm instantly trying to like see from a category, like how I can help them, you know, or maybe yes. I'll become a client of theirs. Like you, you never know. Yeah. So I love that. So that's so cool. So good at the next conference or network event, you know, you don't have to be scared, right? Lisa yeah. has given us permission to say, <laughs> what do we give and who do we give it to? Like, yeah. if you can answer that, you are golden. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I love that. I love that. So from a, as a copywriter and a designer, talk to me about what if, you know, someone's going to invest because sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, women, like you said, you work I also work with women transitioning out of like a corporate role into mm -hmm. their own business. Like they're brilliant in, in what they do and they're ready mm -hmm. to take that leap. And, you know, there's a lot of investment, you know, in starting up, it may feel yeah. like it, you know, it doesn't have to be, but sometimes who the, you know, people who want to do it right out of the gate, they're like, they understand that just because I can try to do it and kind of figure it out and watch YouTube videos and go download mm -hmm. a million freebies and reverse engineer people's funnels. And, you know, you can do that as like, cause you're going to DIY it because you want to be on a budget knowing right. that if you're DIYing it, it's also your time, you know, yeah. versus the woman who comes out and was like, Hey, you know, I'm going to put $10,000 into starting up my business, my say mm -hmm. consulting business. Right. And mm -hmm. I could go and spend time learning and going down what I call the rabbit holes 
to, yep. you know, to learn something versus just hiring someone to take care of it for me. Right. Yeah. And sticking to my lane and doing what I can do, which is, you know, getting in front of possible people that will become my customers so that I can serve them. Right. And charge and make yes. money and rinse and repeat. Yes. I mean, you too probably see where you're just like, no, like don't, you're, you have no desire to be a copywriter. You don't need to like take 18 classes and then go get your degree in it. And then this and that, if you just uh-huh. want to be, you know, own your own hair salon, right? It's like, right, no, right. don't do it. You know, so for people who are starting out or maybe they're just struggling with feeling like their messaging may be all over the place, especially for women, because a lot of us are Jill, Jill's of all trade right? But we're masters of none. Like we just figure it out. You know, what would you recommend that they invest in from a a brand positioning standpoint, like right out of the gate? Yeah. Oh, what a great question. And I will just, first of all, say that um, if you haven't listened to Tara's previous episodes about just some, how to like, sort of like, what are those essential elements when you're first starting out? But there's so much good stuff in there. So I definitely encourage you you to check that out. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. But uh, definitely for me, what I would recommend is invest in the time to do the writing, the writing. And I'm not talking about writing as in writing um, an article or something like that, that's going to get published, but the writing around getting the idea that you have, the vision that you have, and who you want to serve, and what you want to do for them, the problem that you're solving, and um, be writing in response to the problems that you're seeing with your target market, like what are the questions that they ask, what are they struggling with, and be writing in that response, because that is going to give you an incredible amount of clarity And this does not have to be, again, polished writing. It is just a matter of moving those ideas out of your head onto paper and making and going through that process of getting some clarity around that. And yes, it's going to feel messy. And then from there, like I, from a technical standpoint, don't think you need a whole lot of different like tools. You definitely don't need a lot of bells and whistles to get started quite frankly, for a lot of service-based businesses, even just beefing out your profile on LinkedIn, you know, you don't need a website right away, but you can use like your profile on LinkedIn and you can be, again, writing in response to some of those questions that come up for your target market. This is just going to help you really think through your perspective on things how you're going to be problem solving for them and get a better understanding of who it is that you want to work for and and are working for. And then from there, you know, it's just a matter of actually just um, getting, like doing the outreach, like going out there and and finding the people that you would want to work with and reaching out to them. And like from a human to human standpoint, I see so many people get so wrapped up in the technology Mm -hmm. and the tools and so many people who jump into like, Oh, I need my logo and I want to do my branding. And I, you know, and yeah, to some degree, I agree that, you know, presenting yourself professionally is very important, but you don't need to have all of those brand assets and all of that developed right away either in order to start making some, some real outreach. And the more you do that, again, the more that clarity is going to, to come about and the confidence to be out there having these conversations and doing the outreach. I mean, and just like, again, honing in on, on your offers and all of that. I mean, it's it's very impossible to do all of that within a vacuum and like spend all your time trying to get everything all sorted out and perfect before you like get out there and start reaching out and having conversations with people. Absolutely. And, and I think in this day and age, especially as everything is turning much more into the online side, like, you know, it's almost odd to, like you said, have that, Oh, human to human interaction, right? Mm -hmm. In a world where I feel like people are almost allergic to having conversations with people because of the online and they think I'm just going to kill it on 
Facebook and I'm just going to run Facebook ads and I'm going to fill my funnel and I'm going to make a million dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't want to burst anyone's bubble because that's like so sweet and naive. And we all kind of have that at a startup phase. Um, yeah. It's like the reality is it's a lot different. You know, it's, Mm how I built my business. I've been doing this 10 years is like a lot of one-on-one cheek to cheek Mm -hmm. connections, live events, um, you know, doing serving and helping people and having tons and tons and tons of consultations and just helping people without even offering that to sell them anything. And then, you know, through all that, what I call relationship currency, it's like, it comes back to you 500 times. And because of that, like the social, the online side, converts better. And so yeah. we don't have to be like digital experts to, you know, open a business. We just have to be human beings. And I think a lot of the times women are fabulous at this because we're great at relationship building. And mm-hmm. it really is a secret power that we have mm-hmm. that we almost forget about when we, when we start our businesses. So I love that. I love that. So we're going to switch gears a little bit uh, to mm-hmm. talk about sales pages, if you don't mind, because I know like when I hear someone is a copywriter and a designer, there's so much um, goodness that comes in that, especially for sales pages. Mm -hmm. And so knowing, you know, when you're first starting out, so if someone, if a client were to come work with you, Lisa, it would be like, you know, I want to talk through what somebody who's going to hire a copywriter or and or designer or a designer to create a sales page. So, Mm -hmm. and if you disagree, it's totally fine. But I always tell people, if you're going to invest in copy, the best copy to invest in is sales pages, because that's, what's going to make you money, right? Like focus in those areas that are going to make you money, not just make you sound awesome. Yeah. Your homepage is good. Cause you know, that's where everyone hits first. Mm -hmm. But then ultimately if you're sending traffic to a sales page, it needs to look good and it needs to sound good because your website needs to be your number one salesperson if you're driving yes. traffic to that yep. that page. So I love the idea of before anyone would work with anyone, what you were saying earlier is get a journal, get a notebook, pull up a Google doc, whatever, <laughs> however you take notes and just start typing and getting that clarity. Who do I want to serve? You know, what is he or she like? You know, what's my vision? You know, and then yep. from that, things are going to come. And I would imagine that makes your job easier, right? When they Absolutely. have that in place. So can you yes. talk a little bit about if you were going to design and, and write a high converting sales page for uh-huh. uh, maybe just talk about what a sales page is for people who aren't a hundred percent sure. And then yeah. what elements it takes uh, to have a fantastic one. Yeah. Awesome. I know. I, I love this question and I agree with you 100%. That is an excellent place to start if you're going to start working with a copywriter. But even before then, as I said before, to even start thinking through the elements of a sales page, which I'll, I'll share. In fact, I have, um, I've talked a lot about this in the past. I've got more information on my website about um, landing pages and sales pages. And first of all, I guess to think about what a sales page is to answer that question it's a page that someone would go to where they're going to start to understand what the problem is that they have and how you have proposed a solution to it. And that page will include um, information around the benefits and the outcomes and features. And I can explain the differences between all of those too. Um, It may also share some testimonials or stories about how other people have, you know, the results that they've gotten through this basically is working to build familiarity and trust. Mm -hmm. You know, a really good sales page is going to to lead somebody through what I call the customer journey, which is that point of like first becoming aware of who you are, um, moving through to an understanding of their problem or their situation to how you fit into that picture and what your solution is to a place where, you know, you're you're demonstrating credibility and then to um, a final sort of call to action, which would be like, here's the next step. And you know, you don't need to have a sales page to actually sell a paid program. It, It could be that that next step is to book a call, Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, 
join a membership or there's lots of different sort of next steps yeah. that could could be come out of a of a sales page but what i like about the idea of starting with the sales page is because it forces you to go through basically thinking through that customer journey and hitting upon all those points so you cover what the vision is like where they really want to go and what they're trying to achieve you cover what the gap looks like between where they are and where they want to go you cover um, um, what a solution looks like and what that will mean for them you cover um, what your solution looks like and the benefits and outcomes of that you would cover um, your own credibility and your background and expertise and why you um, are able to offer this sort of service and then you cover the call to action so basically through that process you're going to get almost all of the messaging that you will use in a lot of different situations so it's um, an incredibly valuable area to focus on for sure and like when i think of sales pages i think of what's the minimum or what do i need to give somebody to make the right decision if we're, if we're a fit to work together or not right? right so every section of a sales page should overcome some obstacle right it's like mm -hmm. you gotta have something that's catchy right like your headline that um makes somebody go oh is that me oh you know if i say yes. attention all women entrepreneurs blah 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 you know it's like oh i'm a woman entrepreneur right okay mm -hmm. keep reading you know and i i tend to have long sales copy because I myself am a processor and the women I tend to work with, they're either high, they're high processors and uh, they want all the, the data up front mm -hmm. to make a decision, yeah. um, which is also, I'm not a high pressure salesperson. It's like, Hey, take a few days to think about if this is a fit. Right. I want to work with you and you're ready. It's all good. Um, mm -hmm. Versus give me your credit card now if you want to yeah. save $10,000. <laughs> so, uh -huh. um, you know, that style tends to work, you know, the more laid back style is something that I appreciate you know, but I do have clients that are like, yeah, I'm all in, let's go. So they kind of are on both sides of the spectrum. So I tend to do long sales copy because mm -hmm. I want to give all the information ahead of time so that I know yes. if somebody clicks the enroll or, um, you know, let's schedule a consultation that they have facts going into it versus being, you know, where it totally works for some other, for mm -hmm. other people where it's like, Hey, here's, you know, four lines schedule your call and you're like don't know what you're getting into mm -hmm. i don't like to go into anything blind and so i was told once uh, you know i'm often told like your sales copy is so long you know and it's like well okay like i get that and now i have a little thing on some of them it's like tara i'm not going to read all this copy just tell me what to do right so yeah. they can click that and then I love it's that. faster but you know but i don't mind long copy and someone told me once a friend of mine kelly was like copies only too long when you've bored your reader. And so don't yeah. bore them and yeah. you'll be good. If it's like engaging copy, you next thing you know, it's like, oh my gosh, I've been on this page for three or four minutes reading this. And yes. you know, it's a heck yes for me. So, um, you know, what's, what's your thoughts on the specific layout? And, mm -hmm. and of course you want to embed some testimonials in there because that's your social proof and you want people mm -hmm. to align with, oh, he reminds me of me or she reminds me of me, right? And then that right, way people right. can, you know, they feel like you said, I've never thought of it that way. That was brilliant when you said a sales page um, is, is there to build trust. And yeah. I think that's really super important. So um, as far as like layout goes, you know, what's your thoughts on out, you know, flipping to the other side, which would be the designer side, yeah. you know, like how to, how to mirror those, um, it does build better trust and it looks beautiful, right? Not just words yeah. on a page, but that it, you know, has that flow and story. How do you do that? Like, I, I'm yeah. just curious. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Well, I'll address the, the length, the, the length mm -hmm. aspect first, because there's kind of two parts to it. Number one, the answer to how long should a sales page be is the short answer is however long it needs to be. Mm -hmm. to convey the information, build the trust, get somebody very comfortable to take that next step. But really, you got to think about um, what are you asking them to do? What is that next step? What level of commitment are you wanting them to take? So for example, if the next step is to book a call, 
then that's obviously less of a commitment than to go ahead and book or buy a $10,000 coaching program. Right. You know, that those are very different levels of commitment. So that's one part there that, in, so anything that's going to be a really high level of commitment is going to probably require a lot more information for sure. somebody to, uh, you know, to get what they need and get to a place where they are comfortable taking that next step. And the other thing you want to think about related to this is, you know, is the money aspect too. So if you're asking for, if the sales page is for lower priced product, well, then you may not need as much copy as the higher end, but you also want to recognize where someone is at in that customer journey when they land on your sales page. So if you are wanting your sales page to be the first, sort of that first um, impression or that first point of engagement before you've spoken with someone, then that, then you really are going to need like a lot of copy because they, they may not really know about you or what you have to offer. And they're going to need, you know, it's going to take more effort. That page is going to have to work harder yeah. um, because you haven't had that, that in-person or person to person conversation yet. But if they're coming in at a later stage and maybe you've already had some conversation, then they, then you probably wouldn't need as long of a page. That's one part of the length. But the other piece of it is recognizing that you, there are just different types of buying styles out there. And I have a couple of colleagues of mine who talk about sort of, they, they refer to it as like a color-coded buyer. So um, you be, there's like four types and uh, like a, a red, the red color is someone who can make, typically make decisions really fast. So they're like, I don't need all the information. I know I want this or I know I don't, you know, yeah. I know I want this. So just give me the buy button. Right, right, right. You know? yeah. And then you have other people who are like, they're considered greens and they need all the information. They, they will read every single word on the page before they decide if they're ready to take that next step. Mm -hmm. And then you have um, blues who are very like visual people, very emotional driven. So from like a design perspective, you'd want to have um, imagery on there and the words themselves may be very emotive. Um, that's going to appeal to those people. And like, to your point, like if the copy is engaging, you know, people will read and, and yes, you know, for those people, if the, if the copy is very emotional and visual, then they'll, then they'll, they'll read it and respond well to it. And then the last um, type of buyer is like the yellow, who's like sort of the fun loving party person. And they like a lot of like um, more like lighthearted sort of, you know, not be so serious and, and they like humor and, and that kind of thing on your, on your sales pages. So in order to, so, so that's one thing is just recognizing that you're going to have different buyers. So, so you will have people who will respond really well to a long sales page if you have one, because that's what, that's how they buy. And then you'll have other people be like, that's way too long. I don't want all of that. Well, mm -hmm. they may be a red, you know, and so they're just never going to want to have all that information. Right. So, in order to kind of address all four of your buying types on a single page, you'd want to have like a buy button sort of scattered throughout the page, right? So you kind of, that, that will help address your reds. And like, to your point with what you said you did on your own page, it's like, you know, Tara, I don't, <laughs> I'm, I'm never going to read all this. Just what do you want me I'm to do? ready to go. <laughs> yeah. That will address your reds. Um, and then to have, again, from a design perspective, to have some visuals in there, both from like a graphic standpoint, but also just like thinking in terms of the descriptions of your, you know, of the offer, or more importantly, the descriptions of like the situation that your prospective client is in. And, and if that, if, if you can get that across really emotionally and visually, that's going to really um, hook them in. And then yellows, you know, I, I mean, I think, you know, if you're able to add in a little humor or just, or just kind of like, you know, kind of keep in mind that, well, business should be fun. Like yeah. it should be fun. And if you, and if you enjoy the work you're doing and if you can bring a little bit of that spirit to the copy and even maybe even to some of 
your design, then that's going to appeal to them as well. For sure. So I yeah, that. so, so that's my long, long answer. No, to that's, but it's brilliant because there are the four okay. types of buyers and I've, I've heard of the different types of buyers. And it's funny that, you know, some people, they, they use the colors. I use something that's like the, you know, I learned something recently in my, the mastermind that I'm in, it's the gems. Uh, so uh -huh. when you are going like red, I'm like, oh, that's this. And when it's green, okay, that's yeah. this gem. And, uh, you know, so, and then there's also, yeah. So it's really cool to think in terms of, you may have your perfect client, or, you know, I call mm -hmm. it perfect client profile, but you know, you're going to get versions of him or her that are of those four types. And so yes. you might as well just give them what they want so they can make the right decision to, yeah. you know, hit yes or no. So, uh, so I love that. That's a, that's a great, great description on it. So we're going to wrap up here in a minute, but I always have, you know, two things. One, I'm going to make sure that, you know, people know how they can get in touch with you, or I think you have something for the audience that they can go and, and check out. So we're going to, mm -hmm. we're going to do that before we break, but I always like to ask a question. I know you've you may not be shocked by it because you've listened to some of the other podcasts. But one thing I like to ask is, you know, um, a fun question around if you were, if there was a movie that was going to be made about you and, and your life, right. Mm -hmm. um, up to this point, who, what actress would you want to play you? Who would best portray you? Oh my goodness. What actress? Yes. Oh, Meryl Streep. I can so see that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's perfect. I love it. Yeah. You know, Meryl Streep. I can see that. Yeah. Um, that's, that's so good. That's so good. So, um, you know, we're doing this on video, but some people may be listening on audio and it's like, if, if you're not watching it on video, uh, just know you, you have that vibe of Meryl Streep. So yes, oh, you're okay. right on point. I've yet to like ask that question for somebody and been like, Oh, that's totally random. Um, no, it's usually, you know, who you kind of vibe with and it's yeah. really cool. So love it. All right, uh, Lisa, let everyone know how can they get in touch with you, learn more, connect with you. Um, and you know, what do you have for the audience? Yeah. So you can find me at paraphrase com, C O M M dot com. That's my main website, but I believe Tara, you have the link for, I've got a mm -hmm. define your brand's star power blueprint, which really digs more into this whole um, brand positioning piece and also helps you develop like it's got some writing scripts in it to help you develop a response to that what do you do question so that's what I would recommend for and your go, yes and you can go to the show notes and and yeah. click on that link it's uh, training.paraphrasecom.com slash bsp hyphen tv but because yeah. it's long just go that to the show so notes long. and click on it especially if you're driving do not try to write that down <laughs> right um and lisa's website because i felt like it might have like got cut off or something when she was saying it but it's she's lisa hoffman at www.paraphrasecom.com so it's p-a-r-a-p-h-r-a-s-e-c-o-m-m.com when you can yes. learn more about her and and you also do training like three days a week. You yep. go live on Facebook. Yep. Yep. Oh. I'm on Facebook um, live on Fridays pretty much okay. every week. So um, awesome. that's another place you can catch me is on the Facebook page. And I post like three other days out of the week. Just lots of um, resources and tips around the writing and design. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. It has been so awesome having you here. And Oh, I can't wait to stay connected for sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's been my pleasure, Tara. Thank you so much. Thanks. Take care.